Well, today's talk is a very nice follow-up to the one we had uh, like three weeks ago on Saranola Plantation uh, <clears throat> because there are a lot of connections which our speaker, Karen, is going to be talking about. Um, I became interested in uh, Mary Barkin Chestnut's diaries probably as a child. Um, I... Uh, <laughs> I'm a product of the Old South. I had three great-grandfathers who fought at the Battle of Shiloh, and you can imagine which side they were on. <coughs> and I had lots and lots of great aunts. All of them are members of the UDC, and I think all of them had copies of Mary Barkin Chestnut's uh, diary, which was not published until well after she died. Uh, so, um, when I came to Gainesville and, uh, started learning more about, uh, connections, uh, I was even more interested. And then in, in 2000, I was on the National Historic Landmarks Committee in Washington and a nomination for Mulberry Plantation, which was Mary Boykin Chestnut's home for much of her life, uh, came before our committee and I read the very long and detailed nomination. Um, <clears throat> I knew a lot more about, uh, about her and about the plantation. Um, so um, as part of our ILR program, uh, I asked Karen Kirkman if she would come and talk about those diaries. Um, <clears throat> a literary um, uh, scholars of that particular subject acknowledge uh, this diary as the most important piece of literature produced by a Confederate author. And in C. Van Woodward's um, edition uh, of the diaries, uh, he makes that same statement. So they're incredibly important as a primary source for anyone who wants to uh, research that aspect of the, the Civil War, which my great aunt so referred to as the late unpleasantness. Um, <clears throat> well, let me tell you uh, something about Karen. Uh, she is currently president and historian of Historic Hale Homestead Incorporated here in Gainesville. Uh, she's been volunteering there since 2001 and became president of the board in 2006. In 2001, Karen documented the talking walls of the historic Hale Homestead and has transcribed and researched the diary of Serena Chestnut Hale. Uh, she continues to research enslaved people on the five Hale and two Chestnut plantations, which were in Alachua County. Her first book, The History uh, excuse me, the historic Hale Homestead at, at Kanapa Plantation and Illustrated History, uh, co-authored with Dr. Kevin McCarthy, was published in 2014. Uh, she has served on the Alachua County Historical Commission since 2006 and is chair from t July 2020 to September 2023. She also serves as historian on Alachua County's Community Remembrance Project, researching racial terror lynching in Alachua County. Karen is also a volunteer transcriber of Alachua County's ancient records, having transcribed more than 16,000 pages. In 2014, Karen was awarded the Florida Genealogical Society's Outstanding Achievement Award for her transcription work. She has researched and written five state historical markers in Alachua County. She's a graduate of cemetery resource protection training conducted by the Florida Public Archaeology Network. She is currently working with uh, FBAN with that network uh, to put all of Alachua County's African American cemeteries on the Florida Master Site file uh, to help protect them. She also manages the historic Kanapaha Cemetery, founded in 1859. In May 22, 
Karen was honored by the city of Gainesville with its first annual Preservation Champion Award. Well, that's a lot, but I would add that uh, Karen has done uh, an extraordinary job of including the black history uh, and the black population um, that lived at, uh, at Hale Plantation into the story that's being told at Historic Hale Homestead. This is very unlike what has happened at the state property at Dudley Farm. We're trying to remedy that, and indeed I've suggested what Karen has done as a, as a model. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Karen. I've got it now. Good morning. Thanks for coming. Um, it was good to see at least one current docent and um, another former docent is here. There she is. Okay. Um, I think we need to put this on slideshow. Up at the top, in the middle, it says slideshow. Yeah. From the beginning. There we go. All right. So very quickly about the historic Hale Homestead, it was built by enslaved craftsmen and completed by 1856. It's one of the very few plantation houses left standing in Alachua County. Um, and it was one of five Hale plantations. And of course, it's the only one left standing. It was the home of Thomas Evans Hale and his wife, Esther Serena Chestnut Hale, who came here in 1854 from Camden, South Carolina. Um, in the mid-1850s, there was a large migration of planters from South Carolina moving into Florida. And um, there's a lot of names you see today in Alachua County that I know from Camden. And so for, to me, they're Camden names. So, as Mr. Hunt said, I've been volunteering at the homestead since it opened in 2001. So that's a long time. When we first opened, we had information about one enslaved person, and that's it. Now we know a lot more, and we talk about them throughout our tours. Um, but I also started researching the Hale family, and then the, um, the siblings of the Hales and focusing on the ones who came to Florida. Um, and then that got me into the ones who were in Camden. And then I discovered Mary Chestnut, and then I went down what I call a bunny trail. I do that a lot in my research. I'll be researching one thing and something else interests me and I'll shoot down that. Um, so the Mary Chestnut connections to Alachua County, it's something I researched many years ago and thankfully kept my notes when mr hunt asked me to speak about these connections um i had to go find the notes but then i had to um, do more research so my first um knowledge if you will of mary chestnut i was um, born and raised in upstate new york um, was the ken burns civil war series have any of you seen that? It was PBS, yes. Okay, and you would have heard a voice. It was an actress, Julie Harris, who was voicing um, Mary Chestnut reading from her Civil War era diary. So that stuck in my head. It was a wonderful series. So who was Mary Boykin Miller Chestnut? She lived from 1823 to 1886, and this is from uh, the PBS website um, it describes her as a, a diarist and an acclaimed diarist um, after her death, actually. And she was the wife of one of South Carolina's leading politicians, um, James Chestnut Jr. So we'll talk about him, but because of his position, it turns out he became a general in the Confederate uh, Army. Um, they ran in the highest circles of the Confederacy. 
and they personally knew Jefferson Davis and his wife, Irina Davis. So that's one thing that makes her diary um, very interesting and very important. Now, Mary Boykin Miller Chestnut, uh, as Mary Boykin Miller, was the daughter of Stephen Decatur and his wife, Mary Boykin. Um, Miller was a politician. He was a U.S. congressman, uh, South Carolina state senator, and the 52nd governor of South Carolina. Um, his second wife was Mary Boykin, and she was the daughter of Burwell Boykin. And the Boykins were among the elite in the Camden, South Carolina society. Their plantation is still there uh, today. So um, I know this is really detailed, but I'll take each generation one at a time. Um, a lot of these folks had many children. For instance, I'll go back to Colonel James Chestnut. He's the owner of Mulberry Plantation, was, and his wife, Mary Bose Cox Chestnut. Um, he was the patriarch of this big chestnut family. And um, they together they had something like 14 or 15 children. So just to make things more clear, I'm only going to talk about um, just three of the children. And so that, whoops, press the wrong thing. There we go. So there was Esther Serena Chestnut, John Chestnut. So these are two of the oldest children of Colonel James and Mary Cox Chestnut. And then their youngest child and the second of only two boys was James Chestnut Jr. And he is the one who married Mary Boykin Miller. So this is a portrait, a uh, Gilbert Stewart portrait of Colonel James Chestnut Sr. And this is his wife, Mary uh, Cox Chestnut. These are uh, both Gilbert Stewart portraits that hang in Mulberry today. And this is a Mulberry plantation. Um, it was a brick structure. And um, this is from an old postcard. The picture on the right is from one of my visits to Mulberry. Uh, the first time I went, I forget how many years ago, I was invited to sit with their archivist in the basement, the bottom floor of Mulberry. So I spent the day underneath, underneath the place. And I've been back several times. And Mulberry was built about 1820. And the architect, they believe, was Robert Mills, a quite famous architect. So back to um, the family tree. So the next generation, there was Esther Serena Chestnut. She died in 1822, and she married John Nicholas Williams. And then they had a son, David Rogerson Williams. And uh, Serena, as they called her, died just about three weeks after David was born. So David ended up being um, raised by his um, grandparents. Uh, John Chestnut was the eldest of the two boys, and uh, he was Serena Chestnut Hale's father. And he married Charlotte Ellen Whitaker um, in 1826, and she went by the name of Ellen. And then James Chestnut Jr., who was born in 1815, and he married Mary Boykin Miller in 1840. So I don't have photographs or, or anything of the other uh, siblings, but James Chestnut Jr., there are uh, quite a few photographs out there of him, uh, paintings, if you will. And there he is, and that's a rather nice young uh, picture of Mary Chestnut. They were married on March 31st, 1840, but their wedding was delayed because of the illness of James' brother, John, Serena Hale's father. Now, John had come to Florida to fight the Native Americans in the Second Seminole War in 1836, and it was just a three-month tour of duty. 
but somehow he managed to get measles. And the measles turned into some sort of lung condition. So Colonel James sent his two sons, um, John and then James Jr. was accompanying him. Um, they were sent around to take the cures in Virginia at these sulfur springs. I think there was gray sulfur and red sulfur and I forget the other color of springs. And they didn't work. We actually have some letters that um, John wrote to his daughter Serena. Um, he always was very optimistic about his recovery. And then, um, so nothing really worked on him. They heard about a cure, potential cure in Paris. So the wedding of James Chestnut Jr. to Mary Boykin Miller was delayed by that trip to Paris. Colonel James sent them to Paris, and of course it didn't work. They returned home, and John died in December of 1839. And I believe he died at Mulberry. James became a U.S. Senator and a Confederate General. So this is, I found an article in uh, Politico, and it was entitled, Senator Resigns and Declares Support for Confederacy November 10th, 1860, by Andrew Glass. So um, on April 11th, 1861, while serving as an aide-de-camp to General P.G.T. Bo Beauregard, Chestnut was sent to demand the surrender of Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor. U.S. Army Major Robert Anderson refused to surrender. Chestnut then ordered nearby Fort Johnson to open fire on Fort Sumter. As a direct consequence of Chestnut's order on April 12, 1861, the first shots of the Civil War were fired. And I recently became aware of a book that came out just last year, and it, it's, I think it's entitled um, The Man Who Started the Civil War, and it's about James Chestnut Jr. So of course I had to go out and buy that book. So the next generation, so these would be the children of Serena and John, and James and Mary had no children. So looking down here at this level, David Rogerson Williams, and then in, in this case, I'm showing all the names of all six of John and Ellen's children because there are connections. These are your uh, connections from Alachua County to Camden. And then they had, uh, James and Mary had no children. There we go. So David Rogerson Williams married Catherine Miller, um, Mary Chestnut's younger sister. They called her Kate um, in 1846. And they moved to Alachua County in the 1850s. The ancient records, in fact, have deeds that indicate this. And um, they established Saranola Plantation, which you recently heard about, which I think this was part of Saranola. I'm not certain, but. Um, so then we have John and Ellen Chestnut, and here are their children. The eldest was Serena Chestnut Hale. Um, you see her real name was Esther Serena Chestnut, and you saw that exact name. Um, David Rogerson Williams' mother was an Esther Serena Chestnut. Um, there's Serena in probably the best picture we have of her. And there's Thomas Hale. They moved to Alachua County in 1854 and established Kanapaha Plantation. The next child was Mary Whitaker Chestnut. And I don't know if she ever came here, but she married Edward Hale, a younger brother of um, Thomas Hale. The Hales were a very wealthy family in Camden. Uh, their father, uh, Benjamin Hale II, found gold on his property and opened the Hale Gold Mine. And what's interesting today, that property is producing gold. It's owned by a, um, an Australian mineral company today, Oceana Gold. The next child, oh, and by the way, Edward ended up moving down here, live, living by himself, as far as we know. Um, he would 
remarry and move away in the early 1870s. Thomas Chestnut, he married Helen Taylor and moved to Latchwick County in the mid-1850s, um, either with or not long after Thomas and Serena Hale moved down here. And they established a plantation immediately to the east of Kanapaha. And I've never heard the Chestnut family give me a name for that plantation. So I don't know what to call it. And there's Thomas Chestnut. Then James Chestnut, and that's the thing about these families, they just recycle these names. So it's a little hard to keep track. But this James Chestnut was Serena Hale's younger brother. He married Am Amelia McCaw. McCaw is a name that you see a lot in Camden and um, also in Alachua County. Her brother, I believe, was a doctor here in Alachua County. They were the last, they were the last of the Hale Chestnuts to arrive in 1861. And their plantation was located between Jonesville and Alachua. So I would say right along Archer Road, you had to the west, Thomas Hale, <clears throat> then immediately to the east was um, Thomas Chestnut, <clears throat> and then east of him was Edward Hale along Archer Road. Then if you go up to um, Newberry Road at Jonesville, get on County Road 241, you'll see the, well, you won't see anything, but um, that's where James Chestnut Plantation was, Charles Hale's Plantation, Amelia Hale's Plantation, and the other brother, John, at Plantation. Then the fifth child, if you've read Mary Chestnut's diary, then you'll know a lot about him. He was referred to as the cool captain in her diaries. And uh, as far as I know, he never, he never moved down to Florida. Um, he was a happy-go-lucky person. In the diary, uh, Mary Chestnut also calls him Johnny. So when you see references to Johnny or the cool captain, that is Serena Hale's younger brother. Um, he ended up returning to, after the war, returning to uh, Camden and dying up there in 1868. And then the last child was Ellen Whitaker Chestnut. Now it's, it's clear from letters that Serena's parents wrote to her that, um, and these would be letters in the 1840s, that Ellen had a disability. And the Chestnut family um, had a theory about that. that uh, that the Thomas Chestnut family thought maybe it was something like spina bifida or something. But as a child, she had a cart, and, and she'd kneel on the cart and then, then pull herself forward. Um, but at some point, she either came with her sister Serena to Florida or came for a visit. In those days, they would visit for months. But she died at the home of Thomas Hale in 1862, and that's in her obituary. She's buried in the old Quaker Cemetery in Camden. <clears throat> now, Mary Chestnut's diary, there are three versions. I've read all three. Um, after the end of the war, Mary realized that her diaries <clears throat> could be of significance. So she started to rewrite them, because very often, like Serena Hale's diary, they're abbreviated. Um, Apparently, she put some snarky comments in there about individuals, so she tried to sanitize her diaries a little bit, make them into um, complete sentences. Um, and in a little while, you'll see an example from, from Serena Hale's diary, uh, which is very short and abbreviated. But Mary died before she could publish. Um, she also wrote two novels um, that were only published oh, maybe 20 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, something like that, by, one, her, by her biographer, Elizabeth Millenfeld. Um, so this came out in 1905, and that's what it looks like. The next version is the best version, in my opinion. This came out in 1981. It's edited by C. Van Woodward. Now, this one... Um, it's very large, and it's small print, 
But the thing about this one is, C. Van Woodward went to great lengths to research what she was saying and make these footnotes everywhere. And so that's where you can decipher what she's saying and who she's talking about. So that's what makes that very interesting to me, because this is where I found a lot of these connections to um, the, the Florida chestnuts. And then this is a, a small version, just not the whole thing, it's just part of it, that C. Van Woodward and Mary's biographer, um, Elizabeth Mullenfeld, published in 1984. So you, so you see here, Mulberry Plantation. There's people there. I'm, I was there for, there was a, a book signing. Um, the Chestnut family bought Mary Chestnut's photo album. It had been in a private collection for many, many years, and it came up for auction. And the Chestnut family went together and were able to acquire it. So Marty Daniels, who was a, a Chestnut, and the archivist at the time, Barbara McCarthy, um, they published that several years ago. And so that was, I think, from that visit. And then Bloomsbury isn't so well known but that is in Camden. A mulberry is way south of uh, Camden proper. <clears throat> but the north part of Camden is often called Kirkwood. And there is, that was a bed and breakfast. And it supposedly belonged to um, Sally Chestnut, who would have been Serena Hale's aunt and a sister of uh, John Chestnut. And she never married. But the innkeepers there, they were retired um, Air Force colonels and historians themselves, they found the deed in the courthouse in Camden where Thomas Hale sold Colonel James Hale that property about a few days before they left um, Camden in March of 1854. So prior to that discovery, Bloomsbury was always dated to 1849. So they've since revised that. It is no longer a bed and breakfast, however. It recently sold and is a private residence, but that's, that's where I always stayed when I was up there. And then Sarsfield. Sarsfield, um, I drove by it several times. Could never get a good photograph of it. So the best ones are really online. And that was built... The, James Jr. and um, Mary <clears throat> had a number of homes in the Camden area. Kamchatka was one, Frogden was another one. But Sarsfield is where they settled, and this was built in the 1870s, and they uh, reportedly used bricks from the outbuildings of Mulberry to create that. And this is where Mary ran a little egg business after the war to make some money, and this is where she was when she was rewriting her diaries. Um, Colonel James, excuse me, uh, General, General James Chestnut um, died in that house in 1885, and then Mary died there in 1886. So in this version, the one that I like, um, by, edited by C. Van Woodward, there are many references to the Florida uh, Hales and Chestnuts. And this is one, um, I'll just read part of it, October 4th, 1861. Edward Hale was awfully shocked when Mr. Chestnut said, any man who came out of this war without being ruined in his estate would be lucky. Then Mary, what if we are victorious? And even so. Why, I went into, meaning, I went into it meaning to double mind, and I so will, so help me God. That's Edward Hale. And apparently her sister Kate is there and says that's where God's help will come in. It is as God pleases. And, of course, Mary Chestnut remarks, somehow I never associate the name of God with doubling fortunes. 
Then she goes on, Edward Hale said that the government at Richmond had given the states notice they must take care of themselves. Now, Mary, easy enough to say, not so easy to do. How can they? They have stripped themselves of men and money for the armies of the Confederacy. And then you see this is um, the footnote that Van Woodward, C. Van Woodward put there. And this planter of Alachua County, <laughs> so he goes on. So that's why those footnotes are so important. He tells you exactly who she's speaking about. Then another one, now this is a very interesting one to me. On uh, December 6, 1861, the overseer at Mulberry Plantation was named Mr. Teen. So what Mary's talking about, this is a conversation she had with Mr. Teen. So Mr. Teen said, our only chance is to be ahead of them, free our Negroes and put them in the army. In all my life, I have only met one or two women folk who were not abolitionists in their hearts, and hot ones too. Mrs. Chestnut was the worst. They have known that honor for years. Tom Hale said as soon as he married, he found all the ladies of this family hated slavery. That is the only insight we have at the Hale Homestead as to how at least Serena Hale felt about slavery. This is another one, January 16th, 1862. They were raiding two of Mr. C's nephews for not being in the army. And so they talk about, and, and she's having this conversation with um, Mary Kirkland and Mrs. Withers, whose niece Amelia was married to James. There's Amelia, there's James. But, but they're talking about Thomas and James here. Uh, his lungs are weak. I heard that when we married, unsound, they said he was then. Why did your niece marry him then? Because he was sound on the goose, I placidly explained. What does she mean? Oh, mama, don't you know that slang expression? It means he had a plantation and no end of Negroes. Do you mean, turning to me savagely, to insinuate my niece married for mercenary motives, a poor stick? And Mary Chestnut replies, did you mean to insult and slander my nephew-in-law when you said he shirked the army? It was as broad as it was long. Um, it turns out that both Thomas and James eventually uh, joined the Confederate Army, but it was like mid-war that they finally did. But up to that point, Mary found herself in a position to defend her husband's nephews because they did not immediately enlist. This was one toward the end of the war um, on the way, I met a cousin, male, elderly, a C. devant fire eater, nullifier, secessionist, extreme in everything. In Columbia, refused to be seen with his son-in-law, who was not in the army, did not wear the Confederate gray. So I've noted here, that's Woodward's. Um, he's talking about Tom Chestnut, and um, his wife was the daughter of William Jesse Taylor. And so both of them, Thomas and James, eventually enlisted. So Mary Chestnut actually made a visit to Saranola Plantation. It happened in the fall of 1860. It was about a two-week uh, two stay. Now, there's another interesting book about her. It's the biography by Elizabeth Mullenfeld. At one point, she was a professor at FSU, and then she ended up as president of Sweetbriar College. So this is the book, very interesting, but this is where I learned about an unpublished manuscript that Mary wrote. It was called, We Called Her Kitty. And the transcript of it is not in the book. It was in her dissertation, Mullenfeld's dissertation. So at the time, I forget how many years ago, I was a non-tenured faculty member at UF, <clears throat> so I took advantage of the library, interlibrary loan, and I was able to get physically um, Elizabeth Mullenfeld's dissertation from, um, it was a, I forget, University of South Carolina. And I remember getting the call and walking up from Weill Hall to the, um, the library with the french fries, the computer science building, and I came back with this volume. 
It was huge. It was heavy. And unfortunately, there was nothing new in that. <laughs> nothing that Mullenfell hadn't already put in this book. It was a lot lighter. So um, when Mary's sister Kate died in 1876, I think it was April, yeah, um, Kate and her husband David had several children. And since Mary and James did not have children of their own, she considered Kate's children as her own, and she referred to them as the Sweet Williams. So she wanted the Sweet Williams to know more about their mother after she passed away. So it's sort of a biography of Kate. And this is where you find the, uh, the trek to Florida. Mary came to visit her sister, Kate. When we arrived at Kate's, it was late at night. That part of Florida is ugly. It has the same lonely, dismal, swamp, owl, hooting, despairing, depressing effect. And then she goes on to talk about, um, of course, Kate and David named their eldest child Serena. Surprise. And um, Serena had been away. And um, so Serena came with them to Florida so Serena could visit her. Um, her mother, and uh, they didn't tell Kate that Serena was coming. So at first, Serena's hiding, and then suddenly, Serena pops out, and uh, uh, Mary is commenting on the the passion and the love um, that was displayed there upon that reunion. I was choked up with, and nobody has ever wanted it. Um, it was an the feeling of a, a mother, and Mary, um, Mary even wept on watching this reunion. Now, somebody else took note of Mary Chestnut's visit to Alachua County. It was Reverend Dr. William J. McCormick. He was recruited to come to Alachua County in the 1850s, 1858-ish. And he was recruited by the founders of Kanapaha Presbyterian Church, which was organized in 1859. And I'm an elder there for church history and cemetery management. And um, where the cemetery is today, there's a big opening in the middle. That's where the original church stood. So this is an old photograph of the church. And you can see a horse right there. And back behind there would have been um, Kanapaha Lake. And then the front was a, um, there's a historical marker I wrote on Southwest 20th called the Old Stage Road. So there was a road that connected Arredondo to the south up to Fort Clark, and then it carried on up to the forts in uh, Noonansville. And there is a rather blurry picture of Reverend McCormick. He went on to found um, First Presbyterian Church in Gainesville and many other churches, uh, Presbyterian churches in this area. And his descendant, F.D. McCormick, who lives in Ocala, he published, it was very limited publishing, um, part of the day book of Reverend McCormick. So on November 4th, 1860, he wrote, I went out to Kanapaha and preached twice as usual, had several Camden people there, and among the rest, Senator Chestnut's wife. And on the journey back, now this is in Mullenfeld's biography, on the journey back, Mary spent two anxious weeks amid hammocks and Everglades, oppressed and miserable. It was on the train just before she reached Fernandina that the Withers boy tapped her on the shoulder and told her someone else in the car had just received a telegram Lincoln had been elected. For the South and for Mary Boykin Chestnut, it was a disastrous event, but would prove just the catalyst she needed. After the war, the Williams family sold uh, Sarah Noel and relocated to the Carolinas. Now, I'm being nonspecific about the Carolinas because during the war, um, Kate relocated for a while to a, a big mansion they had in East Flat Rock, North Carolina. And today it's a golf course, but the original house is the clubhouse. It's called Kenmuir. Kenmuir. 
Um, so they were back in the Carolinas. Now that is Serena Hale's diary. It only runs from 1874 to um, 1893. And uh, this is very much like the way um, Mary Chestnut wrote her diary. Very short, just phrases. And that's why I've spent years researching her diary with the intent on publishing it one day. <clears throat> February 1885. Wednesday 4th, warmer, very windy all day, clear and cloudy, quite cloudy, 6 p.m., went to prayer meeting, windy night, fires in groves, that's Orange Grove, heard of Uncle James Chestnut's death in Kirkwood near Camden, died February 1st, Sunday, born January 15, 1815, age 70, buried at Knights Hill. That is the actual writing of Serena Hale in her diary. Serena made no mention of Mary Chestnut's death in 1866. This is the Knights Hill Cemetery. This is um, the Chestnut family burying ground. Uh, Knights Hill was initially the plantation of Colonel James Chestnut's father, John Chestnut. And today it's, I'm not sure what it is. It's not a development. It's more like a big private hunting grounds or something, and it's gated off. But I was able to go there a couple times with Marty Daniels, who was the caretaker of Mulberry. And you see the steps. Um, these steps up, put your leg over, and there's steps on the other side. That's the only way in and out of that thing. So um, there was no ADA there. So, And these are the... I would call them box tombs. They look just like this, right here of Mary and uh, James, and they start like right here and go this way. I use this picture because when I was there, I did not bring a camera. And you can see it's well taken care of in this photograph. When I was there, it was not. It was more like this. And if it got anything up there, it's copperheads. So I'm a snake phobic. So, and the interesting thing is this is a horrible picture because you really can't get back there. Um, first of all, you'd have to know exactly where it is. But um, they misspelled chestnut on Mary's headstone. <laughs> I don't know how they did that in the chestnut cemetery, but there they are. So there's the historic Hale Homestead. Um, we're on 8500 Southwest Archer Road. We are just uh, west of Tower Road, maybe a mile west. We're open Saturdays and Sundays because we're 100% volunteers. Um, we did have to close yesterday because the storm the day before had taken a tree down on the power lines, and we had no power and no access, and the fire trucks were blocking us from uh, even getting through the gate because there was smoke from the from the uh, live wire. <laughs> so it was, uh, I know, toward maybe 5 or 6 o'clock that we managed to get a GRU person there and then a tree person to cut. The tree had fallen and blocked access. So long story, but we didn't open yesterday. We have a um, pretty active Facebook page and uh, a web page. Now, we've got something exciting coming up, hopefully this fall. Um, one thing we did after we um, had the visitor center built, visitor center museum, the Allen and Ethel Graham Visitor Center, and that's, we have exhibits, and uh, it's air conditioned. And um, during COVID, um, I created a video called Enslavement to Freedom. It's a good 15 minutes, but it really, tells the full story of what happened here. Um, it talks about enslaved people on, on Kanapaha Plantation, and it also talks about what was going on in Lashua County um, during Reconstruction. It talks about the racial terror lynchings, and I bring that in from my research for the Community Remembrance Project. But we have photos 
from the early 1900s. This is the original kitchen. These are unidentified uh, freedmen. For years, we thought that was Bennett Kelly who'd been enslaved there, but um, on further inspection, we think it might be Dewey, Dewey Strong. At any rate, um, you see it's, it's two doors side by side, and the original kitchen had a wall that separated them. So to get to one, you'd have to go out and into the other. And we've rebuilt it. Um, there will be a place to go through that wall when we're finished. But the, the windows are all on now. Um, they're starting the wheelchair ramp. The doors are going in. Uh, the hearth is done on the inside. Uh, it will not have real fire in it. The homestead has its original heart pine floors uh, from the 1850s. So there's no chance we will have any open flames around it. So um, look for that this fall. We'll have a grand opening. And so Historic Hale Homestead Inc. is the all-volunteer 501c3 nonprofit that operates the house, although we are actually half owned by the Alachua Conservation Trust. And the other half is still owned by the Eloise S. Hale Trust. Um, but the family trust gave ACT a 99-year lease. And that's what enabled them to um, get a grant from the state of Florida for the 1990s restoration. So um, we can't do this without our members and our generous supporters. And we also were in the process right now of applying for marketing money from Visit Gainesville. So thank you very much. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll take those. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Karen. I think that's a fascinating uh, presentation. Um, and I recently read there was one fourth place associated with her writing of the diaries, and that's Chestnut Cottage in Columbia, where apparently they spent a good deal of time during the war. Um, and I note that it's a and b now. Uh, so if anyone wanted to, they could go and occupy the Mary Barkin Chestnut <laughs> uh, suite. I did not know that, but I've heard of it, the Chestnut Cottage, but as a B&B, &B? because Bloomsbury, as I said, was the uh, a bed and breakfast, and you could stay in the James Chestnut Room, you could stay in the Mary Chestnut Room, and the Sweet William's Room, and on the end of each bed was a copy of Mary Chestnut's Civil War. And because in one place in the diary, she's looking out on the, the avenue. And uh, back then, they, um, they had horse paths. And you can still see the horse, horse paths today. <laughs> well, great. Chestnut Cottage is, I think, right in the city. Uh, and they've got a good website. So if you want to look at the exterior <laughs> and the interior, you, you can. Uh, I know there must be questions. I want to echo Roy's thanks for a wonderful presentation. <clears throat> I recently read a wonderful book, a bestseller uh, New York Times called The Demon of Unrest by Eric Larson. And it's about this period and the, many of the characters you just mentioned. So I recommend that to anyone who might be interested called The Demon of Unrest by Eric Larson. Thank you for that. I'll have to look into it. Like I just acquired the, the book about the man who started the Civil War. Um, I'll add that to the piles of books I have on the floor that I haven't read yet. I always think there's going to be a hurricane that's going to take out the power for weeks, and I'll eventually get in there and read those, those books. Anybody else? Karen, I expect the uh, content you've given today uh, is proprietary, but... If not, is it available online or not? Um, which which part? I mean, you'll find a lot about Mary Chestnut's diaries, I think. Uh, I, I guess I'm thinking of a manuscript of <laughs> what, what you a manuscript of what you just told us. Uh, <clears throat> I wonder if it, 
is that available or is it proprietary? It's, um, yeah, I've not, uh, it's recorded. Right. And um, it's, it's actually downloaded on the computer. But um, yeah, there's a lot of information about Mary Chestnut out there, but um, I almost went back to see the Civil War series again, but I didn't have time for that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I'm always surprised to read of this period and the relative youth of some of these people when they passed away. And uh, I'm assuming from childbirth or illnesses, but you would think these were the top people in the society they'd have the doctors they'd have everything available to them and did you notice that in your research that some of them were just gone before they had a chance to sometimes enjoy their homes well the thomas hale thomas and serena had a total of 15 children that i know of and the eldest died at the age of 19 in 1867 he that also had enlisted he was in his teens so he was 19. They did lose a little girl. I think she was about 18 months old before they moved to Florida. Um, and Thomas Hale's mother, the second wife of the gold mine owner, um, she lived from 1795 to 1880. So she had a surprisingly long life. But you're right, um, the Hales lost a couple of their uh, sons. Um, but they were in their... 30s. So and maybe that's just kind of unique, but um, um, there was a doctor, who was it, McKinstry, who would come out um, and visit. Dr. McCaw, who was a brother of James Chestnut's wife, um, he would come out. His day book is in the Matheson. Um, and it's interesting and a little frustrating because uh, he talks about the plantations he visits and the names of enslaved people that he treated and also family, and how much he charged for the visit, how much medicine was administered, what it was, and how much it was. But in no case does he ever tell you the diagnosis. Anyways. That's professional ethics. <laughs> <laughs> they had HIPAA back then. Okay. All right. Um, I have a question about uh, the relationship with Verena and um, Jefferson Davis, does Mary Chestnut elaborate on their personalities or what, you know, how, how affiliated she felt with them? She's around Verena Davis a lot. I mean, it's been a long time since I, the last time I read that, but, but she was around Verena Davis a lot. And then she, it has to be General Hood. Did he lose a leg? There's one she goes on about, he, she talks about the generals. So it's, you know, you, you could start with the first one. It's shorter. But if you're really into the details and want more research, uh, C. Van Woodward did that for you. <laughs> All right. Oh, wait. I'm a former docent, and I want to say that um, if you're new to Alachua County, a visit to the homestead is well worth your time and energy. And then I'm gonna put in a plug for the Recycled Riches Christmas in July sale, which is going on just down the hallway in the Acorn Room. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Ann told me she was gonna put that plug in, it's wonderful. All right, well, thank you everybody for being good listeners and Asking some Thank great you, questions. Karen, for, for being here. And I'm curious, how many of you here have not been to the historic Hale Homestead? Well, it looks like we should have a little tour from Okama to the historic Hale Homestead. Um, so uh, uh, good luck with what you're doing. You're doing a fantastic job, in my Thank opinion. You. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you all for being here.